Clippers 2,000 years ago, and you go, God damn, those guys had it right. And why are we so behind 2,000 years later? Why haven't? But I, I think it's cyclical. I think that, you know, certainly in America, the this post-war generation was all about strength and not showing weakness and and winning and. and and that works to a certain degree, but I, I think a more, um, a more vulnerability, a more getting your arms around your successes and your failures really under, uh, makes for a better um, partner, a better dad, a better son. Thanks for joining us for our weekly film show. We're starting with an out of this world experience with Brad Pitt. James and I both had an age where, you know, we probably lived more than we have left. Mm -hmm. And you start thinking about impermanence. You start thinking of, of your own personal values. My style is, I'm, interjecting something some point of view of mine usually which yeah. point of view were you interjecting here well I, um <laughs> i'm listening yeah to you. yeah you are too and you're calling me out on it too. <laughs> in a good way <laughs> no it's fair it's all fair it's really coming to terms with knowing yourself a full acceptance of yourself instead of uh, living with regrets or uh, the grief um we carry um the loneliness we carry. And so you brought an authenticity to the role that perhaps you couldn't have done if you weren't being open with yourself in real life. Yes, I think, I think that's bang on. And it is the universal human experience. Ad Astra is set in a not-so-distant future that isn't beyond the realm of possibility. Astronaut Roy McGride ha has tamped down his feelings to an absolutely ridiculous degree, which means we see his wife walk out on him uh, early on. His pulse is low. He never gets flustered. Many American movies are about the importance of work, how crucial it is to work for a living and how you should do what the boss says, except when you're an anti-hero who doesn't do what anybody says. Uh, Roy navigates literally both inner and outer space. He believed his father was dead. The government tells him his dad is out there somewhere and may have gone rogue in a way that threatens not only Earth, but the whole solar system. I hate when that happens. I like the clipped military language, the need to know doling out of information, uh, and the fact that he goes to the edge of the universe. There's no souvenir stand there, but there is something worth discovering. As we journey to the ends of the solar system with him, we also take a deep dive into the astronaut's psyche. Having grown up in an era where we're taught to be strong, not show weakness, uh, don't be disrespected, uh, and so on and so forth, that there's a, there's a certain value in that as far as entering in the world and holding your own, but there's also a, a, a barrier that's created with this, um, this, this kind of embracing of the self, because you're denying, you're denying to a sense um, those pains or those uh, um, I guess uh, the things you feel shame, whether real or imagined, um, the regrets in one's life, um, you know, it's denied in a sense. And so we, I, I, looking back again, I think we were asking the question, is, is, is there a better definition for us? Is, is actually being more open provide you with, a, uh, I guess, a, a better relationship with your loved ones?
And I feel like you would really feel for Brad Pitt in that instance. So how does the movie sort of examine that father-son relationship? You, you know, this movie is performing very well, but I did find that particular relationship kind of problematic. It's shot. Uh, like it's a 1950 sci-fi, but it's set far in the future where the moon is colonized. And Tommy Lee Jones's character, we only see him through video and from the past. Either we are uh, not alone in the universe, meaning aliens, or we are completely and utterly alone. And either outcome is equally terrifying. That was a really interesting... We live in a world filled with falsehoods. I mean, <laughs> marketing, advertising, politics are filled with all sorts of falsehoods. It will lead us to a conclusion sometimes that there is no such thing as truth. And that's what happens sometimes, is we, we want to fit in to any kind of group or sector so badly that when things come up that we don't agree with or we know are incorrect, we just hold our silence and we don't say anything. I never forget sitting next to a young man on a flight. He was just a freshman in college. His mom's a college prof professor. And, and I'm sitting there. It's evening flight, and I'm reading my Bible. And he says, is that the Bible? And I said, yeah. He says, are you a Christian? And I said, yeah. He says, yeah, I could never be a Christian. I said, why not? He says, because I believe in evolution. And I said, of course you do. He said, what do you mean? I said, has anybody ever presented you with any other option except evolution? Have you ever been taught anything else? Has anybody talked about intelligent design? Well, I go, no. I said, let me give you a list of books 
And so I started writing all of Michael Behe's books on, you know, uh, uh, Darwin's Black Box and the edge of, uh, ev the edge of evolution and, and uh, uh, devolving Darwin, all these great books that he's written basically saying, not as a Christian, but saying it as a secular scientist, the idea of evolution just doesn't work. It's got so many problems chemically, biologically, genetically. We know that it just doesn't work. It can't be the means by which the world came into existence or creatures came into existence. It just is impossible. And it's interesting how the man gets vilified for saying that. But at the end of the day, people simply repeat what they think is going to be the popular response. And we become people who are silent about a lot of things. When people say to me, well, I don't know how to argue or to answer those questions. Well, let me suggest a, a novel approach. Start studying. You see, I think the most dangerous form of lying is when we make efforts to accommodate the culture by withholding or even compromising what we believe to be true. Truth always matches up with reality. And when you believe a lie, one day reality will crash into your world and create great destruction. I love what the late economist Milton Friedman once said about reality. He said, you can have any facts you want, but you can't have your own reality. And he's talking about economic form, you can't run multiple trillion dollar deficits and not have the chickens come home to roost sooner or later. But it's also true that you can't ignore the laws of God. You can't ignore the truth of God and expect that it's going to work out for you well. Reality is going to ruin your party. And we have abundant historical evidence to see how that has happened over and over and over again. As the psalmist said, the nation who forgets God will perish. History has proved that to be true repeatedly. You see, I think the apostle Paul saw the day we're in coming. I, he warned the Ephesian elders who were themselves in a very intense cultural pressure he knew they were under pressure to tone down their message. We have, I start with one simple question. Why do you believe that's true? Why do you believe that's true? I find most people start falling apart real quickly because they have never really thought of it. They're just repeating what they heard somebody else say. But also you have to be prepared to say, you know what? Let me tell you why I do believe what I believe. And that makes all the difference in the world.